quite fudgy at the, the time we've got, so I might just slightly have to rush through a few sections, I hope it will fit. Um, so, talk outline, why do you want to do anomaly detection, uh, talk about use case of our product, um, then some, I mean there's a massive amount of literature on anomaly detection, thousands of publications a year actually at the moment, so some background on that. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about machine data characteristics. So those are the data sets that we work with. Uh, then how do you design analytics to work at really large scale? Because there's some big, there's some constraints you have to deal with. Um, and then a couple of case studies of the analytics we do. I mean, uh, I'll try and, you know, I, I couldn't sort of talk about everything, but I, I just focused on a few aspects. So just quickly about us, uh, we, we're trying to do this package solution to do anomaly detection time series data. Um, we built our product on top of a database called Splunk. Uh, initially, we, we're trying to open, well, we have an open, a, open API now that takes stream data. Um, we designed our approach from the outset to scale to very large data sets. Um, and we also designed it to operate in a data stream setting. So that means basically you're, you're getting data sent to you all the time. It might or might not be stored as well. Um, but we don't, we don't assume it has to be stored. Um, and its characteristics typically change over time. Uh, and also, finally, our, our software is aimed at statistical and lay people. So we can't present them with uh, kind of uh, things that are difficult to understand, we have to accompany, you know, we have to usually display pictures that they get and they can interpret. Um, so why do you do anomaly detection? Well, many practical tasks, and we saw one in the last presentation, all down to anomaly detection. I just tried to list a few here. So the thing that we started out looking at was detecting faults in IT systems. Um, so that's typically changes in or unusual values in the operation of an IT system, and you're monitoring in all sorts of different ways. Um, I went to quite a good talk actually uh, recently on looking at unusual patterns in satellite imagery, it's particularly to look for deforestation and uh, fires. You get a different change in the kind of green profile. Um, then detecting problems in planes, mechanical uh, devices congestion traffic networks, uh, that's actually the use case that I'm going to talk a bit about, malware detection, network intrusion, those, those are slightly different. You're looking there at a population of users and you're trying essentially to find users who are doing the things that aren't like other users. Uh, road traders would be another example of that. And basically it's a, it's a fundamental tool of uh, data mining and it adds value to many data sets if you can, can reduce them to a uh, key things to look at. So, very briefly on the use case, the, this was just a proof of concept. So, Transport for London had uh, wanted to monitor congestion on bus network, and they also had a database of forms that they knew about on their system, and um, and they had a location and a time for those. And they wanted to correlate those with uh, congestion so that they could potentially rank them. Um, and prioritise fixing things. Um, the bus journeys were actually broken down into links, so you had time series for each link. Uh, you, so this would be a particular section of uh, the. Um, this doesn't show very well. Anyway, this is a particular section of a route, and in total there are about 2,000 routes, and they obviously display kind of daily and weekly patterns, and you get value outliers and potentially uh, kind of. Not, not perhaps so much pattern outliers in this case, but outliers in context, certainly. Um, and we would produce output like this, essentially. So we would detect a period of uh, unusually long journeys, um, and we get a list of the links that are affected at that time, and also uh, we associate probability with those. I'll talk a bit, a bit about that later on. Um, and produce views like this, so you'd have a uh, kind of lateness anomaly view and general health of the system on the map. Uh, and then they would also 
have uh, the, as I say, these faults, and we would correlate those and, and rank them by the uh, the um, amount of delay, total delay, they were causing to journeys. Okay, so that was a use case. So general anomaly detection, and we had we we talked a bit about uh, there was a bit about this in the previous talk. So generally, people kind of try and identify broad categories of anomalies that you might care about. So a point outlier, that's probably a kind of classical definition for an outlier uh, or an anomaly. You have a, a cloud of points and uh, another point that's somewhere away from that cloud outside it. But it could be, you know, there could, this could be a, an unusual shape. I mean, I've made it very simple there. Um, an outlier in context, so that's where the value in itself is, uh, is not atypical, but because it's happening at a particular time, in this case, at this sort of uh, the uh, a period when the, 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 this time series is unusually high or, or at its peak, that value is unusual. Um, bulk and pattern anomalies. So we saw examples where you could apply that uh, a pattern anomaly to a, a time series because it has shape, but you could also apply, uh, apply it to uh, you know, sequences of characters. The key thing here actually is that you often want to find how to construct these patterns as well as identify um, uh, what's anomalous at the same time. So the problem here was actually splitting the data up in this way such that something emerged. And that actually is quite a hard problem. Um, so as opposed to having to find the patterns, having to find what to look for, uh, if you just have a fixed dictionary that you work on, then rare values uh, are certainly anomalous. And then finally, a kind of structural, I'm, I'm calling it structural because you get uh, quite, there are quite a few papers about anomaly detection graphs and actually time series display a similar property. Here there's the feature of this, the, um, the shape of this, or the, actually the generative process of this time series changes at that time. Um, but you couldn't really boil it down into a particular pattern change, something in the generative process of that, something in the structure of that. Uh, data changed at that point. So uh, basically what you measure is very important and most anomaly detection happens in an unsupervised environment. You, you don't have someone who's marking up what they want to know about. They want you to tell them what's unusual in their data set. Um, so uh, in this case, the figure on the left, you obviously can't in an unsupervised fashion differentiate those crosses from those circles, but if you happen to measure the right feature, they become very simply separable by some plane, you know, Z greater than zero. Uh, and in the same way, on this time series, it wasn't, it was visually perhaps clear that something was going on, but in this case, because I know what the generative process of that time series was, I know that the, um, that essentially the variance in a time, a small time interval changed at that point, the smoothing of the brown motion that I, if I calculate the variance in a window, then I can detect that change very simply. So, a few, um, as I say, a lot of papers on this. This is a highly cited paper. This is a distance-based approach by Knox and Ng. Um, the idea is uh, that you have a, uh, a distance that, uh, for which a fraction of the data is further than uh, that distance from you find the largest distance such that a fraction of the data is further than you and you can imagine different, con uh, well it would depend on the distance metric, but you'd have uh, contours here uh, for which, the, you know, for a different value of f, the distance would change and outliers would be points that are, uh, are more than, uh, uh, that, that have unusually large values for this distance. So that was criticised uh, and the criticism was that it didn't happen, so it didn't handle cluster density very well. So uh, the point on the right um, isn't an outlier because in the context of its cluster, it's, it's fairly typical. Uh, the point on the left uh, is atypical for its cluster because the distance to it, from it to its neighbors and its neighbors to their neighbors is unusually large. Um, or the ratio of those distances. So if you have a predictive model, 
then you can do things like maneuver detection. So here we're predicting where the value is going to be, and an outlier would be something that lands away from where we're predicting. Uh, you know, Kalman filtering you can use uh, to do that sort of predictive process if you believe in it, or if you have some grounds for assuming a particular dynamical model for, your, for whatever you're looking at. Um, and then, yeah, an outlier is something that just lands up away from where it typically you have some uncertainty in your prediction, but it lands up in the tail, you know, the tails of that prediction. So, principal component analysis actually has quite an interesting approach that uses uh, robust principal components analysis. Um, the idea is that you decompose uh, a matrix that you, you turn your data into a matrix, you decompose it into a low rank component, so that would be a subspace. Uh, a, a dense uh, component, so that's rank four, uh, but it's small in magnitude. And then you have a sparse component that has uh, large values with respect to E. So those are values that lie a long way from the plane uh, with respect to the size of the eigenvalues of your rank four matrix. Um, actually, I think they're not presented in these terms, but I think these all boil down to the same thing. Essentially, you're trying to estimate a density function and looking for points in the tails of that dis distribution. So the, the first distance measure, well, that, that's exactly what you're doing when you, have, uh, when you have uniform density in your cluster. You know, it's, it's actually very like a kernel density estimator. Um, local outlier is actually even more like a kernel density estimator. So it's, uh, it's essentially, um, it's essentially accounting for the impact of cluster density on the uh, distribution. Um, predictive model where you have a path dependent uh, density function and principal components, you're uh, doing this where your, uh, den your density is a subspace um, and you're doing it robustly as well. And just to make that clear, so perhaps Talking about distance to your neighbor and distance to their neighbors is not so clear, but if you look at contours of the sort of distribution you might fit to that data, then very clearly uh, the point on the right isn't really in the tails of the distribution, the point on the left isn't in the tails of the distribution. And okay, so you have a problem, you know, you have a, a probabilistic model, or you have a, a density function, whatever. How do you compute anomalousness? I won't go into that really now, but there's a link to a paper online which essentially defines a, a way that you can compute uh, a probability that relates very closely to what I think most people would agree is a good definition of anomalous. It's the event of seeing things that are, uh, are less likely, have lower density, and it works when you've got clustered data and um, uh, various other things. So is this the answer? You just get a really good density estimator uh, and compute some score related to how far into the tails the point is and you're, and you're done. Well, I'm just going to very briefly talk about two big problems and they, they I suppose they affect uh, uh, all sorts of things. Um, so survival theory, uh, if, you, you, if you live to a time t with probability t and then you, uh, you, um, you, uh, you have a, a an independent chance of dying in the next interval delta t, then um, you, uh, your probability of surviving to t plus delta t is just the product of those two probabilities. And you can turn that into a differential equation and you get an exponential distribution. Well, if you have uh, uniform points in the interval, then in fact, the distance to your nearest neighbor is at least that large, uh, is at least uh, r, is governed by exactly the same equation. Um, uh, so in two dimensions, I'm assuming everything is Euclidean, uh, you have this extra term, this extra R term, because the volume of the shell essentially is uh, um, proportional to the radius. So as you increase the number of dimensions, the volume of the shell grows with respect to the volume of the ball. And the thing is that points then become increasingly uniform. And so this, this is the case where you have just uniform data in dimensions one to 10. And you say, well, what's the uh, distance? What's the, the, the distribution of the distance to my neighbors? Um, and in fact, you can see in one dimension, there's quite a large dispersion on that. In 10 dimensions, there's a very small 
dispersion and as you increase the number of dimensions this goes to something like a step function um, so trying to discriminate points based on distance when there's no variation in the distance is not a very good idea if you have very high dimensional space um, okay so that's one problem and um, uh, dimensional reduction techniques do help there and it's probably the right way to go in fact um, but there's another problem which is uh, you know you're assuming essentially that you have enough data to be able to estimate this distribution um, and if you have 10 points to estimate a distribution in one dimension in 10 dimensions you need a billion points to get sorry 10 billion points to get the same uh, resolution um, so if you see something odd uh, you don't necessarily know whether it's just that you haven't got enough data that you don't haven't seen something in the vicinity um, or whether you know it's, it's genuinely unusual so very detailed structural anomalies uh, very detailed structure in, in your probability distribution can't really be resolved in high numbers of dimensions um, so you have to essentially simplify your models uh, you don't always want to use the, the, the most you know a the most um, non-parametric approach. So just to, uh, it affects the number of parameters you use. In this case, I was just looking at uh, Gaussian distributed points, and I, I was fixing basically the problem. So you can generalize the notion of uh, cumulative density function for a Gaussian into, uh, to handle um, multiple dimensions. Um, it's just like a, the de a probability that is outside um, it's the, uh, probability that it falls outside a contour radius, you know, the, the amount of this distance, in fact, and it is really, it's, it's, a, it's a gamma function. Uh, um, uh, so you have to adjust the, basically the distance of the point and the mean of the distribution as you go up in, dis in, in dimensions. But if you do that, then you can ensure, ensure that you have essentially the same probability for, for, for each dimension. You should have the same probability for this point in each dimension. Um, and what, what I have here is just an illustration of this as you go from one dimension to 15 dimensions. So uh, here, in one dimension, I've estimated the mean parameter and the variance, the two parameters, um, and that point uh, would live sort of, so this, these are the probabilities, this is the log, uh, minus the log of the probability, and this is over 500 different trials. Uh, different random samples of the generate of, of the Gaussian. Th these are, this is the log of the probability of that red cross in one dimension. This is the log of the probability in uh, five dimensions, ten and fifteen. And you can see by the time you're estimating the full covariance matrix, so that's uh, n n plus one over two parameters plus the n parameters for the mean. The uh, uncertainty in your probability estimate is really large. Uh, you can try and account for this, and there are two ways to do that. You can look at a kind of Bayesian approach where you estimate the uh, distribution of the parameters of the model you fit, or you can bootstrap like this and look at the di look at how much variation you're getting. Is this thing really significant if I randomly resample the distribution? Uh, so in high dimensions, data is very uniform, sparse. And generally, you want to avoid doing multi, you know, full multivariate analysis. You want to look at essentially um, when the data lies near some low dimensional manifold, or if there's some factorization, if there's some independence in your distribution function, uh, then you have to have a way of aggregating across anomaly scores with different marginals. And, um, again, there are, there are good ways of doing that, and there's a paper that links on our website for ways of doing that, uh, something from our website, ways that you can aggregate. So insight isn't always actionability. Um, basically, if uh, you tell someone that their uh, system is operating in tails of their initial manifold, uh, they generally will look blankly at you. Um, and that's a function of user expertise. So you have to present pictures to people that they get, and doing that in, in, in multiple dimensions is quite hard. Um, the other thing I would say is correlation is always useful. So if you can detect that 
uh, anomalies in two time series happen at the same time and generally happen at the same time, more than you'd expect if it was just random, then um, that's, uh, that's really interesting because it could imply a causal relationship. So in, in machine data, you basically have a load of data characteristics you need to handle. You, it's periodic. You get these sporadic features like bank holidays. Uh, you get uh, domain restricted quantities like pretend, uh, percentages. You have lots of different data types, integers, uh, real values, um, uh, categorical data, their uh, correlations, which are low back. So very little is Gaussian, in fact. If you, if you look at the distributions of uh, residuals that fits to time series and things like that, um, characteristics are changing, you're getting as a data rate, and you're getting to their uh, stream of data that varies in the number of events you're getting per second. So you can't tie, you can't necessarily slow down a great deal when the data rate goes up. Um, a million plus metrics for a big system isn't unusual. And I tell you, if you have a, any sort of false alarm rate and you're looking at a million metrics, that's a lot of alarms. Uh, so thousands of events a second and uh, you know, terabytes, actually, terabytes an hour is not uncommon. And net flow data is, is massive. People aren't really storing it because it's too big. That's the traffic on, on a network. Um, so how do you go about trying to do an omni detection on this? Well, one thing is that you want to first of all aggregate your data. You can't get your data to a single process. Typically, it's stored in a distributed fashion. You can't, uh, you can't, uh, you can't transport it all to one place. Um, so you want to get, you want to map it into features that you can then uh, significantly reduce the volume of data. Um, so they're simple statistics like count, minimum, maximum, mean, value, and those are obviously you do. You only need to pass, in order to aggregate a count, you just have to sum it, and you just need to pass the count. So you could have turned a thousand events into one number. Um, uh, actually, there's an interesting problem of looking for pattern, uh, looking for features like this offline that you can then uh, map produce, and things like autoregressive models, you can do that on, uh, and uh, uh, least squares fits, things like that. Um, anyway, the key thing is that because you're, you're, you've mapped your data to a small set of features, uh, uh, a, a much reduced uh, data volume, you can then um, scale to pretty much arbitrary large systems. Um, and you also, this process, provided it's cheap to compute these, this process essentially doesn't work. You, you don't slow down a great deal as the data rate changes. I mean, your throughput doesn't <coughs> slow down. Uh, your, your data throughput. Um, so you might think that this was a disadvantage, but it's a kind of poor man's pattern uh, anomaly detection. So in this process, if we looked at these values, uh, it's not perhaps particularly clear that there's anything unusual. You might say around 500 something happened. Uh, that's the distribution of those values, just uh, so the over uh, histogram over time. Um, if you now look at the time, uh, the mean in a time window, then you can see very clearly because the variance is, the, um, the, the uh, noise was uncorrelated, that essentially there was a step change in the mean of the process at that particular time. Um, and that that's corresponds to going from the left-hand feature, uh, the left-hand cluster to the right-hand cluster, and that would be easy to detect. Um, so, uh, with any sort of online approach, you basically get to see each piece of data once. Um, it's suitable for streaming environments, and particularly where characteristic data characteristics are evolving, and it allows you to scale to uh, pretty much arbitrary large data sets as long as you can uh, keep up with the data rate. So, actually, you know there are very good optimal, well, viable optimization techniques that you can use fairly sophisticated machine learning technique, uh, machine learning approaches uh, with things like stochastic gradient descent. Um, but it, things like clustering is in an online setting is really hard because you're forced to make irreversible decisions or you might be forced to make irreversible decisions. Uh, but basically, if you want to handle huge data, you know, anomaly detection, huge data sets, and particularly in the environment where people want to do that, which is where they 
do it as data is arriving, essentially, and get an answer back as quickly as possible, then it's worth it. So, uh, just to very briefly look at a couple of uh, things about detecting, uh, about uh, sort of uh, predictive modeling, if you like. Uh, so, for a periodic trend, um, first thing, once you've found a periodicity, um, you, there's no real chance of overfitting the data because you, you typically have lots of periods to look at. So you can use non-parametric approaches. Um, so this is, uh, kind of, I think, a quite interesting result. So you just want to minimize the uh, over all functions, all periodic functions, minimize the square of the um, residual. Uh, so x is just an arbitrary function. This is a functional minimization. Uh, f is, is, the, is our target function, you've got some additive noise, then just uh, taking the mean value of the function over this, at a given time, over all periods, <coughs> is, the, is the right function that minimizes this, uh, this uh, first equation, or the, that solves this first equation. Um, so a really simple strategy is just to bucket the data, um, bucket the period, uh, compute means, uh, you just need to store a count and a mean value in order to update that. You can update it online. Um, and yeah, you have to do maybe, you have to interpolate then that in some way. And splines actually work very well. When you have data which has spikes or uh, uh, a sharp step change, any, any interpolation technique like radial basis functions that uh, is supported over the whole interval tends to be unstable and tends to have these kind of weird sort of uh, load-like effects around these sharp points. Um, a really important thing to think about when you're trying to design anything, I think, on particularly when you're trying to deal with large amounts of data, like lots of time series, that sort of thing, is your kind of QR, is your, essentially your memory to QOR. So um, a good example would be don't just use a fixed bucket pattern you adapt the bucket pattern to uh, essentially minimize some quantity that would be related to how quickly the function is changing. Um, and that, that sort of consideration comes, you know, it comes up again and again. Um, clustering data, as I said, is hard. So it's because you have to make these irreversible decisions and those can have bad consequences. So essentially, you try and avoid uh, making irreversible decisions, if at all possible, and the, the kind of the better state of the art for doing that are things like uh, essentially sketch data structures. So you don't actually try and uh, cluster the data as it goes. You um, you keep back for a f you, you fix the amount of uh, number of data points you want to uh, store, and then you um, cluster the sketch. Uh, of that data, and then if you if uh, if you your mom, if you blow your memory budget, you have to merge points. So it's like a kind of overly granular clustering um, that you then run clustering on top of. And if you're doing clustering with say a mixture of Gaussians, think about uh, whether you want to use spherically symmetric or full covariance matrices because this this first one you need one parameter. Uh, one double say on one, you know, uh, 16, uh, eight bytes rather. Uh, in this second case, you need n, n plus one over two times eight bytes. And it might be better to actually use more spherically symmetric Gaussians than a uh, smaller number of uh, uh, arbitrary Gaussians. Um, and this just illustrates why it's hard. If you've seen to that point, those data points, uh, it's difficult to say whether those two blue points are unusual or not. Um, obviously, if you then waited a while, it would have potentially become clear that those were outliers. You shouldn't have clustered those with your other data. Uh, finally, just briefly talk about uh, tail behavior. So, uh, essentially, um, anomaly detection happens in this region. So this is, we talked about fitting distributions to the data uh, and um, 
and that Gaussian visually, okay, it's not a great fit, but it doesn't look too bad. It fits the bulk of the data. But the key problem is that in this region, where you have little data, the fit of that uh, that distribution to the data is, is generally very bad, or it can be very bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's this kind of fat tail, uh, um, uh, fat tail uh, distributions, essentially. Um, and uh, a key pro uh, a key thing to think about is um, expressiveness in tail. So being able to fit different types of tails to the data if you want to do outlier detection. So you know, be able to fit something which is essentially a proper uh, power law tail. Uh, so you know, that massively improves your uh, force alarm, recall force alarm. Okay, thanks.